All right. Oh, I was going with this bump. Do you have the gizmo? Where is it up? Ah, there it is. Gizmo. All right, guys. Let's go ahead and start singing some books of the Old and New Testament. And uh, today, like I promised, I've removed some pictures to see what you guys can do without the pictures. Dum, dum, dum. All right, here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and Letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. All right, that's our card. And I've got us almost three quarters of the way down there to where you can see Romans chapter 12, if we can get through those today. So we got to move kind of quick. So over the, next, um, over the next several review ones, I want everybody out loud to do uh, as loud as you, not as loud as you possibly can. I think that could blow the roof off the place. But, but loudly and confidently respond as quickly as possible to each of these so we can get rolling. Genesis 1. Creation. Creation. Good. Genesis 6 and 7. Good. They're winning over here. Genesis 11. Oh, I, I'm getting a little louder over there. All right, Genesis 12. Good. Genesis 18 and 19. Good. At school, by the way, I always tell my students this. If you are one of those students who is like, and then everybody else said it first, that's the way I live my life. After everybody else has said something, then I come up with my idea. You are a much better learner even if you say it after everybody else, then to just say, well, I missed my opportunity, you'll never get it then. Always repeat it quietly, even after they, other people beat you to, the, to it. I think that's a, a good learning, um, learning activity. Exodus 20. Ten commandments. Ten commandments, good job. Miss Karen? Yes, that's exactly it. That's what I'm talking about. All right, 1 Samuel 10. King Saul. King Saul, good job. 2 Samuel 5. King David. First Kings 2. King Solomon. Good. Somebody over here was really wanting to jump at it and beat everybody else. I like that competitiveness. All right. First Kings 12. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. And we have a song. I hope you were paying attention because the no pictures part is coming up next. Leah, Rachel, Bill, Hazilpa, four wives of Israel. They helped Jacob to bear twelve sons. Dinah was the only girl. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Joseph, Benjamin, twelve sons of Israel. Genesis 1. Creation. Creation. Good. Genesis 6 and 7. Noah and the flood. Noah and the flood. You guys want to go back to like by sections? Doesn't that sound like fun? All right, let's go by sections. We'll go right here. You guys, Genesis 11. Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. Everybody, Genesis 11. Tower of Babel. All right. Genesis 12. Abraham's promise. There's always that one person just, you know, lifting up Moses' arms. Actually, there were two of them, but I heard one right there. All right. Genesis 18 and 19. Well done, Sodom and Gomorrah, back there. Exodus 20. <laughs> Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Remember my, my way of remembering that? Is divided in half, like Exodus 20 and 10, right? It's a divisible thing. It's easy. All right. 1 Samuel 10. King Saul. Now, it should be you guys are getting used to the pattern of Scripture, right? Now we've gotten through what's called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, written by whom? 
Bueller, there we go. Mu Moses is correct. Moses is correct, all right? You get past those and you get these books of history and you get to the first king, 1 Samuel 10. So now, you wise ones, what's the next one here? 2 Samuel 5. King David, good. 1 Kings 2. King Solomon, all right, good job. 1 Kings 12, now. Kings Rehoboam and Jeroboam, good. All right, now, everybody again, collectively. Yep. Temptation of Jesus, Matthew 5 and 7. Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 19. Divorce and remarriage, good. Matthew 25. Judgment Day, good job. Matthew 27. Death of Jesus. Don't be fooled just by the picture. We're remembering it. It is the crucifixion or the death of Jesus, but the phrasing of that one, we have death of Jesus. Good. Luke 15. Prodigal son. Luke 16. Rich, rich man and Lazarus. Acts 5. Not this section. Acts 5. Good job. See, you guys know. You're just, you're just being a little quiet. Ananias and Sapphira. Acts 7. Stoning of Stephen. Acts 8. These are conversions now. There's, I think, four in a row we've got. So, y'all, everybody think about this one. What is this? Conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. What about Acts chapter 9? Yes, that is... Who? I heard one person say it. Yep. Conversion of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Acts 10 and 11. Now, this is really one in his household, but in, to the right, I, I included the sheet that, was, that had four corners with all kinds of critters, all animals of the earth, representing not just Jews, but Gentiles, right? The inclusion of everyone. Who is that? Cornelius. What was his job? Good. He was a centurion. Good job. How many soldiers was he over? Anybody? We have any math majors? 100, good job. Act 16, two conversions there. Who? The jailer, Philippian jailer. Also in the same place of Philippi was a lady underneath the tree with worshiping with other women. Lydia, so Lydia and the jailer, all right? Romans 6, just two more. Romans 6, you want to remember here, everybody say, Baptized into Christ. Baptized into Christ. That's Romans 6. And then finally, Romans 12. Uh, this guy is living right there. You want to see living? It's being able to jump over something really high. So Christian living is Romans chapter 12. Everybody, uh, when I say Romans 12, everyday Christian living. Romans 12. Everyday Christian living. All right, good. We just went through a lot. Let's go ahead and wrap it up with what is true success. What is true success, Hayden? Living your life and going to heaven. Great job, Hayden. All right. What is true failure, Tegan? Tegan's not answering. <laughs> Caleb? Living your life and All right, good job. And what is God's plan for marriage, everybody in this section? Oh, there's a hand. Everybody in this section, what is God's plan for marriage? All right, good job. Let's go back to our seats. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I... Good Sunday evening. Our first song will be number 193, 193, 193. We'll sing all three verses. The spacious firmament on high with all the blue a thrill sky and spangled hem a 
shining frame, their great original proclaim, the unwearied sun from day to day does his creator's power display and publishes to every land the work of an almighty hand. Soon as the evening shades prevail, the moon takes off the wondrous tale, and nightly to the listening earth repeats the stool free of her birth, while all the stars that round her burn, and all the planets in their turn confirm the tidings as they roll, and spread the truth from pole to pole. What though in soft and silent soul move round this star terrestrial ball, what though no real voice nor sound amid their radiant orbs be found, in reason's ear they all rejoice and offer forth a glorious voice forever singing as they shine the hand that made us is divine. 18S. We'll sing this before the opening prayer. 18S, verses 1, 2, and 3. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of man? Oh, you rescue the souls of man. You are the one that we pray. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we're hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we pray. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all the many blessings that you blessed us with. Thank you for letting us gather here today to worship you. 
Thank you for the elders and the deacons that we have here and the work that they do. And be with the sick that was mentioned this morning and those dealing with the loss of loved ones. Be with them. Be with us as we go through the rest of this worship. Let everything be done in accordance to your word. And thank you for send, sending your son to down the cross for the remission of our sins. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Number 78, 78, and our song of encouragement will be number 408, 408, if you want to mark that if you're using the books. Let's stand for this song, please. He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. Brighter the way grows every day, walks in a heavenly way. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. Praises to him, I King. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. With a chorus, he gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my King. The book of Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31, Matthew by inspiration paints a picture. It is a picture that we ought to be awestruck by. It, it looks into the future of something that you're going to go through. It also peers through the future as something that I'm going to go through. In the book of Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 31, we read, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory with all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. 
It is an awesome image of that day, that day that we call Judgment Day. It's also mentioned in the New Testament as being an hour. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, we read these sobering words, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This thought is somewhat reiterated in the book of Acts chapter 17. In verses 30 and 31, now verse 30 tells us the importance of repentance and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. We might stop and we might ask the sobering question, why? What's the rush? What's the big deal about a change of mind that results in the way that we live our life from a life of sin to a life of righteousness? Why should we repent? Verse 31 tells us this, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. We are going to see something awesome one day. Oh, it doesn't matter if we pass from this life or not. Our bodies are going to be resurrected. We're going to be resurrected and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And one day we are going to see this take place. A matter of fact, our Lord says this in the book of James chapter 5 verse 28 where He says, Marvel not at this. Don't be astonished. Marvel not at this for the hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear His voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Each and every person that has ever lived is going to be a part of that day. Everyone who has had the breath of life and then the breath of life cease, they are going to take part in what we've just looked at. But there are some things, even though there's going to be a judgment bar, even though there's going to be a judgment day, even though there's going to be a judge, and even though we are going to be there, there are some things that are not going to be at the judgment. We're going to take note of just a few of those this evening. Number one, there is not going to be one unbeliever at the judgment. There is not going to be one unbeliever at the judgment. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, now faith is the substance of, of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Oh, we understand we've never physically seen Jesus, but we've read about Him. We know about Him. As we look at the book of John chapter 20, do you remember Jesus speaking to Thomas, that, that man that seemed to doubt in him? And, and He told Thomas in about verse 27, Reach hither thy hand, fingers and feel my hand. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, Thomas. In verse 28, Thomas, we, we don't read that he actually did those things, but we do read his words where he looked in, at Jesus Christ into his face and he said, My Lord and my God. Verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they which have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. Why? That you might believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. We understand how faith comes about. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? The Word of God, Romans 10, 17. But yet there are not going to be any unbelievers. But Keith, I thought that there are those that do not believe God's Word. Well, you're exactly right. Right now, they don't. Right now, they do not believe 
in the words of the Bible. Maybe they don't believe that Jesus Christ, there are those that do not believe He even lived. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Who's going to see this? I can I guarantee you those that are unbelieving right now and those that have ceased from this life, that have passed from this life, there were unbelievers while they were walking the face of this earth. They're going to see this take place. They're going to see all that are in the graves that heard His voice come out and come forth from that. John 5, 28 and 29. Oh, they may not have believed then or before then, but they're going to believe at that time. A matter of fact, once you look at the book of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, Behold, He cometh with clouds. And listen very carefully. He cometh with clouds and every eye shall see Him. And they also which pierced Him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of Him. Those that were atheists while they lived upon the face of the earth, those that are going to be atheists when Jesus comes back, to take back His own, even though He's not going to step foot upon the face of this earth again, we're going to meet Him in the clouds. They're going to be seeing this. And then they're going to believe. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, and, and oftentimes we look at, at 5 through 8, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made Himself of no reputation, and took upon, upon Him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as in he, that is Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now look at verse 9 beginning. Wherefore God hath also highly or also hath highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the book of Romans chapter 14 and verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. Can you imagine? Can you possibly fathom being one of those individuals, one, one of those, maybe your school peers, maybe your work peers, maybe somebody that you're even related to, one of those that say, well, I believe it's a good book. I, I believe maybe Jesus Christ was a good man, but he was a good teacher. Maybe he was a good moral person. I, I just don't believe everything that, that the Bible has to say about him. I, I really don't believe he's Lord. I really don't believe that there's a God in heaven, maybe. Remember, we looked at Luke chapter 12 this morning and in the parable, and God called that man a what? A fool. In the book of Proverbs, we read about God calling another man a fool. The fool had said in his heart, there is no God. It may be one of those people that you know that has the very idea that I really don't believe. I, I remember going to school years ago with a young man, and it was just noised abroad that this young man didn't believe that there's a God. Everybody was astonished. I can't believe that he doesn't believe in God. Who wouldn't believe that there's a God? Well, there's, there's one. But you know what? It seems to be the, the case that there's more and more. Isn't it sad? But on the day of judgment, there's not going to be one unbeliever at the judgment bar because they're going to have seen and they're going to bow and they are going to confess. Number two, Number two, there is not going to be one material possession at the judgment bar. None of our possessions are going to, going to go with us. 
Everything is going to fade away. Everything in this life, everything in this world is considered even in Bible terms as being corruptible. Even nature itself, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, for all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. The grass withereth, the flower falleth away, and who's like the grass and the flower? We are. Our bodies, they grow, they get older. We begin to, to lose our eyesight and maybe our hearing and and I heard of one of our young men today, he, he said, I fell in love with somebody, went to a restaurant, and, and he, he called out some kind of name, and, and I misheard him. <laughs> I didn't hear correct. I'm, I'm noticing that. Ask Lynn. <laughs> she can tell you. I don't hear like I used to. I don't see. That's why I have to have these. You know, right now, as I pull these glasses off, used to I used to be able to see the details of each and every face that I was preaching to. I can't see the detail of any of you right now. I know who you are, but I have to put my glasses on to see your faces. When we think about trophies, medals, I remember playing baseball, I have trophies. At home, I have awards at home. I have them placed in a box and in my basement. Every now and then I'll get them out and I'll look at them. Don't know what I'm going to do with them, really. You know, when we think about sports and achievements in sports, we, we, we're really proud. But, you know, those things are going to, to fade away one day. You think about 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run, so run that ye may obtain. And everyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. In other words, the crown that, that they run for, the crown that they try to obtain in their racing and in their athletics, it's, it's a crown that's a corruptible crown. Now, during this time, there was something called the Isthmus Games. It was only second to the Olympics. Their crown was a, a crown of celery. <laughs> but you know what? Even precious metals in our mind, they're corruptible. They're not going to last forever. A matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 18, listen to this. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter, by inspiration, calls gold and silver, silver corruptible. These things are not going to last forever. That man that we talked about and, and this morning in and, and the parable of the man that was going to pull down his barns and build greater, and those like-minded, we're not going to be able to take one thing with us. Everything is going to be destroyed. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. On judgment day, there's not going to be one unbeliever. On judgment day, no material possessions are going to be taken to heaven. Number three, on the day of judgment, there's not going to be a mistrial. There may be some people that have hopes of a mistrial. I remember one, one lady telling me, I know that I'm living in sin, but I hope, I hope that on that day of judgment that I still make it in. There's not going to be a mistrial. As we look at the judge in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, and if ye call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work... Number one, the judge has no respect of persons. 
no respect of persons. A matter of fact, in Ephesians 6, 9, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. He's not going to play favorites on judgment day. He's not going to love one nationality more than he loves another nationality. He's not going to love one gender, male, more than he loves the female gender. He's not going to love anyone more than another. He's not going to show more mercy than he... No. He has no respect of persons. No respect of persons. Somebody says, well, I hope he shows mercy to me. I, there's hoping for a mistrial. In the book of Acts chapter 17, once again in verse 31, if you listen very closely to the wording, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. We're going to be judged by someone who has no respect of persons, number one. Number two, we're going to be judged by someone who's going to judge us, judge us with righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. And then when you look once again in, Matthew, in John chapter 5, rather, 28 through 30, remember, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming when they that are all that are in the grace shall hear his voice. Look at verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and listen very carefully to Jesus' words, and my judgment is just. You know what my mind goes back to? My mind goes back to this morning's lesson. 1 Samuel chapter 8. You remember Samuel's two sons, Joel and Abiah? Remember how they did not walk in the ways of their father? Do you remember that they turned aside after lucre, that is, unjust gain or profit. They took bribes. They perverted judgment. Listen, if, if you want to get in, here's how you do it. If you want me to lean more toward you, here, no, we're going to be standing before a judge that has no respect of persons, a judge that is going to judge with righteous judgment, and a judge that is a just Judge, we don't have to worry about being in front of some corrupt judge. In the book of Romans, chapter 2, who will render to every man according to his works. We're going to be judged not according to my wife's works, maybe the husband's works, your children's works. No, we're going to be judged by our individual works. That's righteous. That's, that's just. As we think about Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. So here's the picture. On judgment day, we are standing before the judge of all judges. He has no respect of persons. He's going to be a righteous judge. He's going to be a just judge. The father shall not give, uh, give account of his son, neither shall the son shall uh, give uh, uh, an answer concerning the father. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. These books are going to be open. To us, it is going to be Matthew through Revelation. We're going to have to give an account of how we lived our lives in accordance with His Word, with His will. John chapter 12, verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. You think about this scene. Here you are, standing before Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we sing songs about that. Face to face with, with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what shall it be? When in rapture I behold Him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. He is now our Savior. On that day, He's going to be your judge. He's going to be my judge. There's not going to be a mistrial. We're going to be judged very, very fairly. And no one's going to be able to look at Him and say, you don't know what I went through. Uh, you're, you're God. You don't have a clue the temptations. No, Hebrews 4.15 tells us. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. 
He can say, friend, I know exactly what you went through. Depart from me, I never knew you. When we look at the book of Romans chapter 2, verse 16, we see something else. Something else that's not going to be at the judgment. There's not going to be one secret at the judgment. You know, we may be able to have secrets and, and hold these secrets and hold our cards close to our vest, so to speak, and, and you know, a man's wife may not know, a, a woman's husband may not know, uh, the children may not know, co-workers may not know, your bosses may not know, and it may be something that you could very well be fired over, something very well that your, your spouse would divorce you over, something very, that very well could, could harm your children's life and be detriment to them. It, it could be something that would bring them down low and think badly of you for the very rest of their lives. You may be able to keep a secret like that, but on Judgment Day, on Judgment Day, that secret will come out. In the book of Romans chapter 2, verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. God is going to judge the secrets of men. There's not going to be one secret at the judgment. Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm 90 and verse 8, our secret sins are going to be in the very light of His countenance. In Jeremiah 23, 23, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Do we honestly think that we can go to one place where God cannot see us? God cannot behold what we are doing. God does not know what we are thinking. God does not know what we are hearing. Do we honestly believe that there is a place, whether it's a closet, whether it's in the depths of the earth, in a cave, do we honestly think that we can go to any place, anywhere, where God doesn't know and get away with it? God knows. And the secrets of men are going to be brought to the forefront on judgment. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. Let that sink in. He's going to bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In the book of, of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God knows, Jesus knows why Think about this, friends, while Jesus was on the face of this earth. He even knew the very thoughts of some of the people that were trying to go against Him. Why think ye evil in your hearts? Over and over we can read those sentiments from our Lord. Do we honestly think that we're going to be standing before Jesus Christ on judgment and He's not going to know our secrets? He's not going to know our thoughts. He's not going to know our actions. He's not going to know our words. Friends, He's going to know and those secrets are going to be brought to the forefront and they're going to smack us in the face if we have any. There's not going to be one secret upon the face of this earth. There's not going to be a baptistry at the judgment. There's not going to be a baptistry. While people live upon the face of this earth, they have had time and opportunity. I have known people that have grown up in the Lord's church listening to one sermon after another, one lesson after another, been in the Bible classes and heard the teacher speak one lesson after another on baptism, on conversion accounts, even some of those version account, conversion accounts which, which Cade was going through with our young people just a moment ago in the, from, from the book of Acts. It is the, the book of what? Conversions. But every one of those conversions had something in common. Baptism. 
Because you see, baptism is where one gets into Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4, where all spiritual blessings are found. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And Ephesians 1 chapter 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. There's not going to be a baptistry at the judgment. There's not going to be anyone that's going to be able to say, well, I, I listened to them, but you know what? I thought I was all right just like I was. I, I really didn't think that I had to do it. I thought all was well with my soul. But, but now I, I, I see that I was wrong. Can I go now? Time and opportunity. Depart from me. I never knew you. Friends, that's a sobering thought. You think about that day when our Lord comes back and, and the earth and the world is burned up and the works that are therein, we also read of this same account, this same day, this same hour in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 7, going through verse 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels taking vengeance on them, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Scary thought. How does one obey the gospel? Romans 6, 3 and 4, through the very act of baptism. But yet on judgment day, He's coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that have not done that. On that judgment day, there's not going to be a baptistry for those who, who waited for those who thought, well, I've got the rest of my life. For those who may have thought, well, I believe it's faith only. No. No baptistry there. There's also not going to be an invitation song. No invitation extended for those who have already obeyed the gospel. Oh, there's an invitation given to us now. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, come... And let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely. Right now the invitation stands. But one day, one hour, one judgment seen, there's not going to be an invitation. You see, when we take our last breath, there are no more invitations going to be given. No more invitation songs that are going to be sung. Time has ceased. Opportunity has vanished. In closing, open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 25. And in Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 1, we read a parable. A cast alongside, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A parable lay. It is a parable that we need to pay attention to because it has to do with us. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, now the kingdom of heaven is the church of our Lord. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. So here's the kingdom. Here's the church. Here's some members. Let's say ten. Five wise, five foolish. They're waiting for the bridegroom, Jesus, to come back and receive His bride, the church. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil and their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. 
Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him into the marriage, and the door was shut. Did you catch the wording? They that were what? Ready. Verse 11, afterward came also the other virgins. In other words, that would imply those that were not ready. Saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. But we know it's going to happen. Friends, right now we have time and we have opportunity. It may be that you're here and you have not yet obeyed the gospel. Why do you wait? Why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in His sanctified throne. One day, time and opportunity will be no more. I have seen young people perish in car accidents, thinking that they were going to live out a very long life. I have seen a young man about 19 or 20 driving over the mountain from working at Walmart all night long and he fell asleep at the wheel and he perished. Friends, we're not promised tomorrow. A man led a prayer one evening that was my relative, my cousin's husband. He got in his vehicle with my great aunt, his mother-in-law, drove not a tenth of a mile, pulled over, slumped over the wheel, and passed from this life with a heart attack. Let us not leave here tonight. Let us not go out those back doors unless we are prepared, unless we are ready. Because, friends, there's a great day coming. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please make your life right with the God of heaven while together we stand and sing. The voice of the Savior says, Come, the cross where he died is in sight. In now at the cross there is room. Are you coming to Jesus tonight? Are you coming to Jesus tonight? Are you coming to us tonight. The bride and the spirit invite. Are you coming to Jesus tonight? Oh, who to himself will be true? Coming to Jesus tonight. Are you coming to Jesus tonight? Are you coming to Jesus tonight? The bride and the spirit invite. Are you coming to for those of you that have not had the chance to take the Lord's Supper this morning, it's prepared for you in the front here. You can come over here to the front pews and you'll be served.
Let's give thanks uh, for this uh, unleavened bread. Father, as we all commune with those who are seated here, Father, help us to uh, put our minds on the cross. Help us to uh, think about your son's immense suffering and your great gift um, of a savior for our lost state. Father, we're thankful for this bread which represents the Savior's body hung upon the cross, beaten for our sins. Father, we're grateful for, for that sacrifice, and uh, it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's also give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father, we're also grateful that your son shed blood on the cross for our sins. We're thankful for the purification that comes through that, the cleansing power of your son's blood. Father, we know that's the blood of God that was shed on the cross and without it we would have no remission of our sins. As these partake of the fruit of the vine may they do so in a way that pleases you, thinking about these, these things uh, that were part of your will. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Also this evening, the opportunity to give is still available for all of our members who are not able to do so this morning. Let's also once again give thanks for the uh, offering, uh, which if you've not been able to offer, is, um, you may do so at, at one, any of the baskets in the, in the lobby. Father, we're thankful for your rich and bountiful blessings. You give us uh, all things, Father, and for every breath, for every uh, step in, in our walks, we give you thanks for continued existence on this earth. We're thankful for your long suffering that copes with and deals with and anguishes over the sins we commit as we seek to be obedient children and falter on occasion. Uh, Father, we're thankful for your gifts and today we pray that you'll accept our offering uh, as we've given. We pray, Father, that it's not been of abundance or of necessity, but uh, out of goodwill because of the way that you have taken care of us this week. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. It's good to see everyone this Sunday evening. If you're visiting with us here to Jacksonville Church of Christ, please know that you're our honored guest and we invite you to come back any opportunity that you may have. Just a few announcements and reminders before we're dismissed. Uh, Compassion card team number two will meet tonight in the elder's office. The JCSC dinner in Devo for the college students on Monday night. That'll be tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. in the fellowship building. Also, the men's Bible class will meet Tuesday at 8 a.m. in the fellowship building. This coming Wednesday, birthday cake celebration, the youth and college age celebrating September birthday. Uh, you're invited to stay after Bible class Wednesday to enjoy the cake and fellowship. Also, the denominational doctrine class will meet this Thursday at 6 p.m. in the fellowship building. We extend our sympathy to Franklin and Chris King and the passing of their son, Frank. Let's continue to remember that family in our prayers. Also, Sister Frances Ship, cousin Gladys Cagle, uh, in the passing there. Let's remember Frances Ship and her family. Uh, if you had not already done so, please be sure to pick up a Sunday bulletin and let's continue to remember those that are in need of our prayers. Uh, Sister Kim Bullock, it's my understanding that she's trying to get into Encompass Rehab here at Jacksonville. Her shoulder surgery went well, but she's 
uh, trying to get back to Jacksonville. Um, I won't go through the entire list, but we have a few additions. Uh, Matthew Christian has been sent home with hospice. Uh, also, we have prayer requests from Shirley Morrow of Piedmont, who is in uh, Regional Medical Center in Gadsden. Also, Martha Garner from Piedmont is also in RMC in Gadsden. Let's continue to remember those in prayer. Uh, also, Blake's uncle, George Walker, he is in the last stages of cancer and has had a difficult weekend and hospice has been called in today for him. So let's remember Blake and that family. Let's continue to remember the sick and shut-ins and especially those suffering from cancer and other illnesses. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, please stand. We'll have a closing song and closing prayer. Our closing song will be number 871. 871, we'll sing verses 1 and 3. I'm looking away beyond the dark screen to heaven's fair all which I There are millions have gone. Go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, so thankful to be here today with our brothers and sisters in Christ and worship you in, in peace and safety and comfort. Thank you for uh, loving us and, and protecting us and blessing us. Thank you for uh, the body of Christians who meets here in Jacksonville. May we always uh, do everything according to the Bible. May we show love to others and may we shine your light out in the community. Father, we're mindful of many who are listed in our bulletin, many who we've talked about uh, that are sick. We ask you to be with each and every one of them and uh, restore their health to them and be with them and their families. Also be with those who recently have lost loved ones, mindful of uh, the King family, uh, Francis Shipp and, and others. Uh, be with them, be with others who've lost loved ones recently in the near recently and in, in the past and, and help them and comfort them in their grief thankful for uh that heavenly home which awaits us father 
and uh, the sufferings and the trials here on this earth, which are nothing compared to the glory up there. Thankful for your love, mercy, and grace. Thankful for Jesus, your son, who died on the cross for our sins. Please forgive us when we fail you. Help us to confess and repent and turn away from those things that would keep us from the kingdom.